Hello class 10 students, greetings of the day. Today we are going to study the second chapter of history which is growth of nationalism. So we have already studied first chapter in class which was about revolt of 1857. We saw that how the revolt of 1857 took place, what were the reasons there. And uh, now in this chapter, we are going to study that how nationalism grew up in India, especially in the second half of 19th century, means the period which starts from 1850s to 1900. We will study that uh, what is the definition of nationalism, did nationalism was there in India before the arrival of British people. We will also try to understand that what were the reasons for the spread or the factors promoting the growth of nationalism in India, why nationalism in India grew up and uh, we uh, will study about one very important organization of India which played its role, you can say a very crucial role in Indian national movement and the name of that organization was Indian National Congress. And uh, we will also study that how the Indian National Congress was formed and uh, which were the organizations there in India before the formation of Indian National Congress and how those organizations or associations or societies helped in the formation of Indian National Congress. We will also study uh, about uh, uh, let me check whether it is there in syllabus or not. Yes, we will also study about some uh, reformers like uh, uh, Rajaram Mohan Roy. Okay, so let us begin our chapter growth of nationalism. See, before starting this chapter, let us understand what is the dictionary meaning of nationalism. So, as you can see here, it is written nationalism it is a dictionary meaning okay from merriam webster nationalism is a political social economic ideology and movement characterized by promotion of interest of a particular nation especially with aim of gaining and maintaining the nation's sovereignty self governance over its homeland so nationalism is a political, social and economic ideology. What is it? It is an ideology, social ideology, economic ideology, political ideology and movement, right? And it is characterized by promotion of interests of particular nation, right? Particular nation like India, China or any nation, especially with the aim of gaining and maintaining the nation's sovereignty in order to gain and maintain national sovereignty. Sovereignty means the right of self-determination, self-governance, rule without interference external interference okay over its homeland so this was the definition given in the uh, dictionary right now what is actual definition or the definition which you are supposed to write in exam when it is asked in exam so basically two marks question is asked uh, about what is nationalism what do you mean by nationalism or what is the meaning of term nationalism so you are supposed to write nationalism refers to the feeling of oneness and common consciousness uh, that emerges when people living in a common territory share the same historical, political and cultural background, have the same language, cultural value and consider themselves as one nation. I am repeating again. Nationalism refers to the feeling of oneness and common consciousness that emerges when people living in a common territory share the same historical, political and cultural background, have the same language, cultural values and consider themselves as one nation. So this I would like to uh, explain you with the example of Iran. Like suppose Iran. Iran is a territory okay, where people live there. Okay, So the people, those who are living in Iran, they have one common territory, they can move from one place to another place, right? 
and they share same historical, political and cultural background means their history, their culture, their polity is same, right? And have the same language which is Persian there, they speak Persian everybody, right? And they are having same cultural values. So these all you can say uh, things, right? Uh, same historical, political and cultural background, it unite all Iranian people, right? And they have a sense of oneness, they feel that they are one, right? Uh, they are not different than uh, other Iranis, right? So this feeling of oneness and common consciousness is actually nationalism, right? When you have such kind of feeling, when you yourself is not, uh, you can say, uh, an individual you don't consider yourself to, uh, means when you consider that your interest are not different than the interest of your neighbors or the people living in your town or city or region or in entire country okay so when that type of feeling you have that is actually the feeling of nationalism when you feel that we all are one and we are having a common interest right when we talk about uh, India, actually in India, uh, India is a country which is, uh, you can say, having so many diversities and still we are having unity, unity in diversity, right? So in India, uh, people of different races, people of different, uh, you can say, religion live here and uh, they... Uh, speak different different languages like in Bengal, Bengali, Maharashtra, Marathi, okay. But still we have feeling of oneness, right. So the definition of nationalism in case of India may uh, worry a little bit, right. But actually the definition of nationalism is what I have told you, right. So don't get confused that sir, we are having so many diversities in India and we are having different languages also, different cultural values also then how it's possible that we may have nationalism. It is possible we are having nationalism in India despite of these all odds. Okay. Now, uh, let us begin with factors promoting the growth of nationalism. Right. These factors are asked in exams. Uh, they ask you in two marks questions, three marks questions. Right. Okay, uh, write the three factors promoting growth of nationalism or they especially uh, may ask that uh, what were the economic uh, uh, factors which promoted nationalism in India like this. Okay, So factors promoting growth of nationalism as you can see here. right? So the first here we have categorized economic exploitation by British. right? Economic exploit, exploitation by British was one of the factors which promoted growth of nationalism in India. right? It uh, spread the feeling of oneness among Indians. Uh, they felt connected okay on the you can say when they will they all were being uh, exploited economically by the british people and they were having same pain so this pain brought them together right and uh, uh, spread integrity among indians uh, then repressive colonial policies of lord lighten we will study socio religious reform movement we will study right role of press rise of middle class and spread of Western education, right? These uh, six factors we are going to study the factors which were responsible for the growth of uh, nationalism in India. Now, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, there uh, is a reduction in syllabus okay, for academic year 2020 and 21. So from this chapter, uh, two factors, economic exploitation, as well as repressive colonial policies of Lord Lytton. These two factors have been removed, right, or reduced from the syllabus. Now, uh, but these two factors are very, very important in order to understand the actual history, okay, and uh, these two things will help you uh, in further competition also when you appear for UPSC or some other competitions. So we will study these two factors also. Okay. So I have discussed about factors, right? 
So before starting these factors, there are some three points, okay, which are about nationalism. Uh, French Revolution inspired Indians to have their right of self-determination. Now everybody know about French Revolution. We have studied in last classes that in 1789 French Revolution took place, okay, and uh, it inspired Indians to have their right of self-determination. In France, there were three, uh, you can say, classes, right? And uh, these three classes of three estates, uh, in these three estates, the third one was suffering a, a lot, right? Uh, the, the third one class comprised of peasants, right, and uh, other poor people. Uh, it was, you can say, having uh, a population of 90% population of uh, France fall under that third estate. And that third estate was forced to pay huge taxes, right? And uh, uh, they were being exploited economically, right? And whereas the uh, second and first estate, they were enjoying a lot, right? and they were not supposed to pay even taxes. So this was, you can say, social and economic disparity in uh, society of France. And uh, that large population which fall under third estate revolted against this second and first estates, right? And uh, it broke out in the form of French Revolution of 1789. And uh, then they got you know the right of self determination self determination uh, of you can say taxes and equality liberty and fraternity these three things were set up in the society of france so this thing this french revolution impressed indian society also indian people also and uh, they uh, also followed these principles and tried their best to achieve all these things in india right it encouraged them to uh, grow the nationalistic feeling in India. Then second point, social religious reform movements united Indians and gave them a sense of oneness based on religion, language, race and culture. Right, social religious reform, reform these are, this is one of the factor also which we will study in next um, pages that how the religious reforms and social reforms by uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy and uh, uh, Jyotiba Phule, okay, and other such people helped uh, in growth of nationalism in India. Then, third, modern ideas of equality, liberty, and rights attracted Indians to strive hard for the protection of their rights by forming various associations and unions. This we will uh, see. This these three words you you are aware of equality liberty and fraternity also these three words are derived from french revolution right and these were the modern ideas the writings of john locke rousseau uh, you can say inspired uh, indian nationalists a lot to uh, you can say give a momentum to the uh, to the nationalism in india so these modern ideas of equality where all people were equal, liberty, where they were free and rights attracted Indians to strive hard for the protection of their rights by forming various associations and unions. So at the time, Indians were not considered equal by the British. They were not free to do so many things, right? And uh, they were having very limited rights also. They were being uh, economically exploited. They were being uh, socially harassed, okay? And uh, even they felt that their... Uh, the Britishers were interfering in their religious affairs also. So all these things, right, uh, you can say uh, brought Indians against the Britishers and especially these modern ideas were liked by the Indian people, okay. The people liked this equality principle, okay. The large section of Indian society was, you can say, uh, the socially deprived people, okay, those who are SCs and STs in today's time, right. The people also uh, felt uh, that uh, uh, that this this thing is going to do some good to them, okay? And it impressed or attracted all such uh, socially deprived people, okay? So all 
these things helped in promoting the uh, nationalism in India. Now we are going to move towards next page. Okay. <clears throat> now here it is written very important nationalism. This is definition of nationalism which I have already read for you. Uh, once again, I will read it. Nationalism refers to the feeling of oneness. Feeling of oneness when you feel that you are one, not separate. Like uh, uh, Sambal people feel themselves one. Okay. And in Sambal, within Sambal, you are having, you live in so many Sarai's, like Deepa Sarai people that feel that they are one. And uh, uh, people living in Rampur, they feel themselves uh, one. Okay. And within Rampur, the people, those who are living in one particular Tessie, like Shabbat, they are having, you know, feeling of oneness. So that type of feeling of oneness, right? Nationalism refers to the feeling of oneness and common consciousness that emerges when people living in a common territory, okay, the territory is common, share the same historical, uh, cultural, political background. Now, uh, this historical background, you feel connected when you study about, you know, um, uh, ancient India, okay, and when you feel about medieval India, right, then you feel that okay, uh, the history of India uh, was of your forefathers, okay, and uh, uh, these were the achievements of your forefathers, and you become uh, happy and take pride in that also, right, so you, it means okay, you are having a common history background, okay, and political and cultural background also have the same, and they have same language, like we speak in Hindi or Urdu here, in uh, uh, India, cultural values and consider themselves as one nation. So these, this is the, the, that thing. Okay, this is the definition of nationalism. You have to remember. Now we will study about the factors promoting growth of nationalism. So economic exploitation by British. This is the factor. This will not be asked. This will not be tested in exam this time. But then also we are studying this. So. Indian realized that the general aim of British was to promote their own interest, not the welfare of Indians. It promoted nationalistic fervor among Indians. The economic discontent of different sections of society was as follows. Okay, so Indian people realized that uh, the general aim of British British people was to promote their own interest, to collect as much wealth as they could to drain the wealth of India to Britain. Okay. In starting, Indian people thought that okay, British have come here in India and uh, their country is well developed. And now, when they will rule on India, our, our country will also be developed and people will become prosperous. Right. But later on, they realized that okay, actually the interest of British people was not to. Uh, increase prosperity of India, but rather increase prosperity of Britain. They were draining out the wealth of India towards Britain by imposing heavy taxes on peasants, by ruining the artisans and by ruining the Indian handicraft industry. Okay. And uh, by harming India economically, socially, politically, by all spheres. Okay. So this here we are going to study about the economic exploitation. So how they exploited Indians, right? They exploited peasants, they exploited artisans and craftsmen, they exploited working class, right? They exploited educated Indians also, right? So how they exploited, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> how could they exploit peasants by imposing hefty taxes, right? And by forcing them to produce cash crops and uh, by uh, not giving them, uh, you can say, sufficient uh, price for their crops. Okay, so these were the reasons. They were the main victims of British colonial policies. Government took away a large part of their produce in the form of land revenue. Okay, so government used to collect the large part of their uh, produce in the form of land revenue, right? And uh, not even this, they were also forced to grow some cash crops like indigo and cotton, which were not very beneficent for them as they were not getting uh, the good prices for that type of cro uh, crops and the uh, uh, cost price was very high 
and uh, they were not getting benefited by that. So, by forcing peasants to grow cash crops and by imposing heavy or hefty taxes on peasants, right, uh, they were exploiting Indians, peasants. Then, second, the artisans and the craftsmen. See, artisans like the weavers, okay, craftsmen, weavers and other people, right, uh, they were also ruined by Britishers. You know, uh, before the arrival of British, in Indian economy was, you can say, the villages were self-dependent economy. Within a village, you could have found anything, the thing of necessities were available within the village, right? But later on, when British came, they nationalized it, okay? And uh, uh, they, the market became urban, okay? And uh, uh, it was the, the self-dependency uh, of villages were, was lost. Now they became dependent on other cities or villages for uh, the availability of other goods, okay? So, this was done. And, you know... Uh, in Lancashire, in London, the cloth was produced by the uh, machines, textile machines. And the price of production was very cheap. Okay, And the quality of that cloth was very good. So that cloth or that textile was uh, exported to India and sold here in India. Okay. And the quality of clothes produced by Indian people was very rough, okay, which is called khaddal, right? And uh, uh, the price was also very high because it was produced by hands, okay, not by the machines. They were having hand looms, and with the help of hand looms, the textile was produced, right? So the people started purchasing that English cloth in first, uh, uh, first stance, okay, and then later on, what happened? In starting, it was cheap, but later on, uh, when the Indian handicraft industry or textile industry was completely ruined and shut, then they increased prices of that same cloth and earned a huge profit by that. Okay, so this is how they ruined the Indian handicraft uh, and artisan industries. Okay. So here India became a source of raw material for industries in Britain. Okay. Uh, they Britishers used to pay uh, in advance to the Indian farmers to grow a particular type of crop, like to cotton, right? And uh, uh, indigo, indigo was used to color the cloth. So Now, uh, when they used to pay in advance, right, so all the raw material was purchased by them, by the Britishers and was exported to Lancashire or uh, one city in England, okay, there. So, there that raw material was uh, processed and changed into the textile or cloth and was again sent back to India, right, or disposed in Indian markets. So, this is how, now because of this, uh, the Indian peasants were not getting raw material and the price of raw material also you can say uh, shoot up right it went very high so Indian, Indian uh, uh, you can say artisans were already suffering okay and after this they suffered a lot artisans and craftsmen lost their jobs as handicraft industry was ruined by British economic policies and their factories okay so they lost their jobs I, I, have, I have already told you Okay, this will not be asked in exam, so let us not go in detail. Now, the working class, the Indian who worked at the factories uh, of Englishmen were exploited by them. It became a reason for their discontentment against British. Working at English factories broadened their understanding. They realized how British were exploiting India from villages to cities. It grew in them a sympathy for their countrymen which was changed into a feeling of nationalist nationalism later okay so the working class was also being exploited the working class was the people those who were working in the industries or factories owned by britishers okay or englishmen 
and uh, they realized that how these Englishmen were ruining Indian economy and uh, destroying our India. Okay. The next point is educated Indians. Earlier educated Indians hoped that they would be benefited by British and their capitalism in getting government and various other jobs but sooner they realized that British policies were exploitative and their economic salvation lies in freeing themselves from the British rule. It united them all and promoted growth of nationalism in them. Right. So, educated Indians like the, you can say, uh, modern ideas of British people. They consider themselves very modern and their economy as a fast-growing economy. And they hope that they will also get jobs in uh, some private and public sectors there. But when, uh, then after that they realized that actually they, they uh, were not getting any kind of job by the British people and uh, British people were, you can say, paying less for higher works and uh, they uh, realized that okay, the salvation of Indian people is not working under the British but to get freed themselves from the clutches of the British, right? Next point is repressive colonial policies of Lord Lytton. This this was very very important point. I am saying this was not is okay, but actually it has been removed. So, but we should know about the policies of Lord Lytton. The repressive policies of Lord Lytton, who served in India from 1876 to 1880, acted as a catalyst for the growth of nationalist movement in India. Okay, so these uh, policies of Lord Lytton acted as a catalyst or a booster for the growth of nationalist movement in India. So, which were the policies? Uh, he uh, organized a Grand Delhi Darbar, right? Lord Lytton organized a Grand Delhi Darbar in 1877 to proclaim Queen Victoria as the Empress of India. Lakhs of rupees were spent on the event, but nothing was done for Indians who were in the grip of famine. So, in 1877, he organized a Grand Delhi Darbar, right? Lakhs of rupees were spent there. Uh, but at the same time, in India, people were suffering from uh, famine, especially in Bengal region, right? So, nothing was done for them, right? So, this was, you can say, uh, something which distrusted uh, Indian people, right? And uh, Indian people, you know, uh, didn't like all these things, right? The, especially this act and their anger against British rose up, okay? Again, now Vernacular Press Act 1878. This is one of the very, very important act passed by Lord Lytton. It was passed in 1878. Vernacular Press Act. Vernacular means uh, language, colloquial language, the language of uh, common uh, co conversation or bol chal ki basha, right? Vernacular Press Act of 1878. Vernacular newspapers like Bengal Gazette, the Sambad Komudi, the Miratul Akbar, the Kesari and other were widely read and uh, they had a great mass appeal and encouraged nationalism among Indians which prom uh, pro prompted Lord Lytton to pass Vernacular Press Act in 1878. It forbade vernacular papers to publish any material that might excite feeling of dissatisfaction against the British government. Okay. Uh, so, what was Vernacular Press Act? See, first of all, you should understand okay, why this act was passed. Actually, uh, the co the common people, okay, they used to understand Bengali, Hindi, Uriya, okay, it was their common languages, right, or it was their uh, languages of uh, colloquial languages, right. So, these used to impress a large section of Indian society and it used to create public opinion. So, uh, these papers like Miratul Akbar, Kesari, Maratha, Komudi, the Sambad, okay, <coughs> sorry, Sambad Komudi, Bengal Gazette, these all papers were creating public opinion against the Britishers, right? It was realized by the Britishers that okay, if they allowed them to continue all these things, then again a large section of India will stand against the Britishers. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> then, uh, Lord Lytton in 1878, he passed Vernacular Press Act and according to this act, uh, it forbade vernacular papers to publish any material that might excite feeling of dissatisfaction against the British government among Indians. Okay. 
among Indians. So, means the Kesuri, the Maratha, the Miratu Lakbar, these papers were not allowed to publish such a material, right, which were against the Britishers and which may create a negative public opinion uh, for Britishers, right. So, this was, you can say, uh, an act to curb the freedom of press, right. But later on, this act was repealed or cancelled by Lord Ripon in 1882. Okay, that was very, very important, but it will not be as an exam. Next is Indian Arms Act 1878. Indian Arms Act of 1878 made it criminal offense for Indians to carry arms without license. This act was not applicable to the British. This license was seen as a badge of inferiority by the Indians who were very upset. So, license, uh, you can say the Indian Arms Act was passed in 1878. According to this act, Indians were supposed to have a license uh, for carrying arms, whereas Britishers were not supposed to have license for carrying arms. So, this uh, was not liked by Indian people and uh, was said as a mark of a badge of inferiority, the license was seen as the badge of inferiority by the Indians who were very upset. Then next is C.P. Ilbert Bill Controversy 1883. Okay, what was that? Let us see. Under Lord Ripon, C.P. Ilbert, the law member of Viceroy's Executive Council, introduced a bill to grant Indian judges who were as qualified as European judges the power to try Europeans, right? Earlier, uh, the power to try Europeans, okay, was uh, was not with uh, not not with Indian people, but with British people. Means Indian people could not try or listen the cases related to the Europeans. Like if suppose two Europeans or two British people are fighting, okay, or if one British is involved in some case, okay, so that case will be listened in, would have been listened in the court of British judge only, okay, not the Indian judge, right? So the condition was so. But later on, you can say uh, <clears throat> Lord Ripon, Lord Ripon was one of the great reformists, okay, in Indian administration, and he was, you can say, pro Indian. Uh, his all policies were uh, for the benefit bene benefit of Indian people, right? So he uh, bro tried to bro uh, brought some reform in this, and he allowed Indian judges, right, to try uh, British. Okay, so when it was drafted or presented, so be before the council, so it was not liked by the people, right, and they resented against this. Okay. So, European judges, <coughs> sorry, there was a uproar against the passing of this bill in the original form. Finally, the European offenders were given the right to ask for a trial by jury, half of which would be white. Okay. So, it was not liked by the white people. Okay. And they said that these Indians cannot try us. Okay. We are, uh, we are superior race. So, later on, uh, what happened? Uh, because of their anger, because of their uh dissatisfaction then it was decided that okay, if uh, they means a jury which is containing half number of judges as white and half number of judges indians okay so uh, that jury can try the case of a, a british person or a white person there was a uproar against the passing of this bill in the original form finally the europeans offenders were given the right to ask for a trial by jury, half of which would be whites. Then after that, <clears throat> this made the Indians realize that under the present setup, even when the Viceroy wanted to help Indians, he could not. Thus, the only way to get justice would be to change the very setup of British authority in India. So they said that okay, when even the Viceroy right wants to uh, bring some changes in India and to do, you can say, some kind of uh, uh, welfare, to want to take some kind of welfare measure for Indians and he was not allowed. So how can they expect other welfare measures or 
uh, reforms to be brought by these Europeans, right? And they said that ke their uh, salvation uh, lies uh, in their independence, okay, or to change in the changing the very setup of British authority in India. <clears throat> okay, fifth one was lowering age for civil services examination for Indians. The maximum age limit for civil service examination was lowered to 19 from 21 to make it difficult for the Indians to compete. Okay, so earlier the maximum age limit was 21, right, for ICS Indian civil services examinations, but then Britishers uh, reduced it to 19. At this early age of 19, Indians were not able to crack it because Indians were not having resources. Okay, they were <coughs> uh, they were not ready to crack this exam at this very young age of 19. Okay, so you can say to keep Indians uh, away from Indian civil services, right? Uh, they reduced the uh, maximum age limit for civil service examination for Indians. Now, removal of import duties. The import duties on British textiles were removed. It, it proved harmful for the Indian industry. <coughs> okay, so uh, the textiles which were being produced in Britain, okay, and if those textiles were being imported to India, right, they were not supposed to pay duty or tax on that, right. If Indians were supposed to, if Indians wanted to export their textile to England, they were charged a very hefty, you can say, taxes. Okay, so it ruined Indian, uh, you can say, <coughs> uh, Indian um, uh, textile industry. Okay, now next is socio religious reform movement. This is the third factor. Okay, promoting growth of nationalism. <coughs> Sorry, I am not well. <coughs> Raja Ram Mohan Roy set up the Brahmo Samaj in 1828. Okay, this Brahmo Samaj was set up by Raja Ram Mohan Roy in 1828. Actually, it was first Brahmo Sabha and before that it was Atmi Sabha. Atmi Sabha was founded by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Then its name was changed to Brahmo Samaj. Uh, Brahmo Sabha, sorry, uh, and then to Brahmo Samaj. Swami Vivekanand set up the Ram Krishna Mission in 1897. Dayanand Saraswati set up Arya Samaj in 1875. The Theosophical Society was set up by Colonel Olcott and Madam Blavatsky. Annie Besant was a co-founder of the Theosophical Society. The unique feature of this movement was that they did not ignore the political aspects of human life. Okay. So these socio-religious reform movements also uh, promoted growth of nationalism in India. Right? How we will come to know in next pages. <clears throat> so all these reformers try to teach equality and to do away with caste system. When they when you promote equality, right? It means you are uh, making uh, Indians one and again promoting Indian nationalism right they gave special attention to 